but we are starting a new series called Cancel Culture. And we live in a culture right now that um, if they don't like what you say, if they don't like what you believe, if they don't like your opinion, if they don't like what you stand for, they cancel you, right? They cancel your voice. They try to cancel your influence. They try to cancel your platform. They try to cancel everything that you are about. And how do you and I stand firm in a culture like that? And I want to give you guys some homework to do for all of you readers. There is a great book that goes along with this sermon series that we're going to be speaking on for the rest of the month of June. It's called The Daniel Dilemma by Chris Hodges. The Daniel Dilemma by Chris Hodges. And it is a great resource for you to read, a great resource for you to go through that speaks a lot of truth with what we are dealing with. Um, We are gonna be speaking on a lot of heavy topics that people are uncomfortable talking about, the churches are uncomfortable talking about, but that we have to talk about. And we're gonna be speaking the truth in love. So um, we're gonna be talking about LGBTQ plus next week. Um, We're gonna be talking about politics. And some of you, my goodness, need that sermon this week. Um, But we're gonna be talking about politics the week after. We're gonna be talking about gluttony. We're gonna be talking about all kinds of things that affect us, but we're not talking about because we're afraid to be canceled, right? We're afraid of the fallout of it. And yet there's got to be, there's got to be a church. There's got to be the voice of a biblical standard saying, no, 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 no. It's not this. It's not that in a very loving, calm way. Here's the truth about this topic, about this area. And so today I want to talk to you about the canceling of truth as we go through this series today, the canceling of truth. And here's the truth about this message. This is a foundational message we have got to get before we go any further in this series. Because if we can't agree on today's message, you're not gonna agree on anything else about the messages and the topics to come around. Um, Because today, it's not about my truth, it's not about your truth, it's about what does the Word of God say and His truth today. Several years ago, about eight years ago, I spoke at a chapel at ORU, got to speak to their student body, and um, it went pretty well, and literally the week after I spoke, I got an email from a church in England, in London, England, just outside of it, inviting me to come be the keynote speaker at their conference. And would I consider um, flying with my personal assistant? I'm like, you don't know me. I have no personal assistant. Um, I'm not that big time. Um, But would I and my personal assistant mind flying first class and having a nice size honorarium as a result of being the keynote speaker at this conference from two days and spend a week in London and they'll take care of all my expenses. And I tried to play it really calm and cool. Like, yeah, let me check my schedule. Right? Like, like, you know, the answer, I'm like, heck yes. Um, but I was like, let me, let me check my schedule and get back with you. And I talked to Casey. I was like, Casey, can you believe this? Like, I thought it did okay, but I must've killed it at ORU. Um, because people internationally were watching. And, um, so I start, I, I confirm that my availability is, um, you know, I, I'm available to be there in my busy, busy schedule. And, um, I'll just find a way to pencil you. I had to move some things around, but I think we can make it work. And we, we started getting things organized and I started giving them pictures and I started giving them some information like, you know, where the pastor and all these things. And then it started getting a little weird, right? And they started asking for my bank account and my routing number so that they could send my honorarium straight to my bank account. And so Um, Before I do anything like that, I check with Casey. I'm like, hey, I just want to let you know they're asking for this. And she's like, like, well, Justin, I I think that's weird. And I don't know if this is legit. And I just stopped her for a moment. I'm like, Casey. (laughs) I'm like, you're not used to being treated like a famous person. This is how famous people are treated, right? And she's like, well, give me, give me, <laughs> give me an hour and let me do some research. And Casey all of a sudden turns into true detective and just starts researching called Google and just Googles preaching scams in London and literally everything in my email, the website, everything pulled up. And, and man, the website 
was a legit website. The email sounded legit. Everything looked really, really real. And she saved me from making a horrible decision, from harming myself and her, from hurting ourselves by just researching, is this saying really true or is this just a scam? Crazy thing is I just spoke at ORU this past March. Literally a week later, I get another email inviting me to another conference that was the same scam, just a different website. And it looks real. Like I showed Seth, he's like, this looks real. I'm like, I know. He's like, how do you know it's a scam? I'm like, Google. He's like, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? It looks real. It looks true. It sounds good. It sounds true. But it isn't necessarily true. And this is where we are as a culture, is that many of us, we are following what sounds true, what looks true, what sounds good, it feels warm and fuzzy, but that doesn't mean that it is true. And there is a passage found in 2 Timothy chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4, and Hebrews chapter 2, and when I read it, it jumps off the page, and it's a warning of things, excuse me, that sound like the truth and look like the truth, but it's warning us, man, man, listen, this, this is a scam. And these verses show us the reality of the world we're living in and even how some of our churches are behaving. Second Timothy chapter four, verse one through five says this. I solemnly urge you in the presence of God in Christ Jesus, who will someday judge the living and the dead when he comes to set up his kingdom, preach the word of God. Can I tell you here at Foundation Church, I don't preach my opinion. This whole series, I will not be preaching my opinion. I will be preaching what does the Bible say? Because my opinion doesn't matter. Your opinion doesn't matter. The Word of God is what matters. Preach the Word of God. Be prepared whether the time is favorable or not. Patiently correct, rebuke, and encourage your people with good teaching. For a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. Can I tell you, we are there as a society and a culture now. They will reject the truth and chase after myths, but you, you should keep a clear mind in every situation. Don't be afraid of suffering for the Lord. I would say it this way for our, our series. Don't be afraid of being canceled. Work at telling others the good news and fully carry out the ministry God has given you. Ephesians chapter four, verse 11 through 15 says this. Now these are the gifts Christ gave the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility, my responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. This will continue until we all come to you to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. When that happens, then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every new wind of teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever. They sound like the truth, right? It sounds good. It looks good. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. Can I say, the pastors across the nation Love to preach Ephesians chapter four, verse 11 through 15 when it comes to getting volunteers. Their job is to equip the body of Christ to do the work of ministry. Guys, it's up to you to do the work. There's truth in that, right? However, there's a big part that we are missing and our job is to continue to preach the truth so that the body of Christ, the church, comes to unity in our faith and knowledge of God's son that we will be mature in the Lord, meaning we are measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ and then it has a result. That means we will no longer be immature and we won't get tossed and blown about by every new wind of teaching because we know what Christ has said in his word, who he's created us to be in the commands that he has given us so we're not getting fooled and we're not getting scammed. Because if we don't do this, 
right? If we just follow our itching ears, if we follow what we want to hear instead of what God's word says, here's what's gonna happen. And it's a warning found in Hebrews chapter two, verse one. It says, so we must listen very carefully to the truth we have heard or we may drift away from it. And some of us today, we know people, we have loved ones, we have family members, we have friends, we have peers, we have coworkers, and maybe some of us, we're here today, we're not listening very carefully to the truth, but we're more listening to what we want and our desires and our preferences and our opinions, and what has resulted is we have drifted somewhere we were never intended to be, and we are chasing after myths instead of following the truth. So... There is a warning and a commandment that Christ has given us, and it is our first point today. Today, it is about following the truth, not finding your own. Today, it's about following the truth and not finding your own. Today and through the rest of this series, some of you here, some of you online, you're going to say, well, Justin, I don't agree with you. And that's fine. You don't have to agree with me. Justin, I don't agree with your opinion. That's fine. You don't have to agree with my opinion. But can I tell you this series and today's message, it's not about my opinion. I'm not preaching my opinion. It is God's word. And what does God's word say? Because if you're going to be a follower of Christ, you may not like the truth of God's word, but you still need to follow it. And some of us are at a place We want to follow our itching ears. We want to follow what's popular instead of what is biblical. And there's four things Jesus never said. Number one, he never said, just listen to your heart and follow that. Number two, he never said, be true to yourself and find your own truth. Number three, he didn't say happiness is what matters most. And number four, he didn't just tell you to be a good person. Because can I tell you, good people don't go to heaven, forgiven people do. There's a big difference. What Jesus actually said is found in Luke chapter 9, verse 23. Then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple, a follower of me, must deny themselves, take up their cross daily, and follow me. Deny their opinions, deny their preferences, deny what they think, because he's given us a better way to live our lives and follow after him. So there's two major truths today we can't drift from. We're gonna, I'm going to hit things so fast. Good luck keeping up. Two major truths. We can't drift one. The first one is this. Jesus is the Son of God and the way to heaven. Right now, there's a lot of teachings that he is a way instead of the, the way. As a follower of Christ, man, can I tell you, that sounds great. It sounds rosy. It sounds wonderful. Love wins. But can I tell you, that's not biblical. Jesus said this in John 14, verse 6. Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It's really clear. Jesus didn't say, I'm just a good idea. He didn't say, I'm I'm a good way to live your life, or I am a way, or I am a truth. No, he said, I am the way. I am the truth and the life. And if you want to experience eternal life, If you want to experience heaven with your heavenly father, it goes through a personal relationship with me. Second truth that we can't drift from is this. The Bible is truth. The Bible is truth. It is a guideline. It is a map on how, an instruction book on how to live your life out. And we're going to spend most of our time right here. What is happening now is that we want to dismiss God's word instead of following God's word. And we want to make ourselves the exception to the rules of what is in God's word. And we want to say this stuff, well, me and God have our own understanding. I've heard this a lot. All right, like, like we got our own thing going on. No, you don't. No, no you don't. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, like, well, I, I, I'm, just, I'm just doing it a different way. Oh, you're doing it different, all right. And you're not the exception to the rule, but what's going to happen is you are going to be the victim to your exception. And the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, he says, but evil people and imposters will flourish. They'll deceive others and will themselves be deceived, right? We're there. But you, 
You must remain faithful to the things you have been taught. You know they are true, for you know you can trust those who taught you. You have been taught the Holy Scriptures from childhood, and they have given you the wisdom to receive the salvation that comes by trusting in Christ Jesus. All Scripture, everybody say all. All Scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and it teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. The problem happens with when the Bible starts showing us and telling us we are wrong. And I'm meeting more and more people who want to dismiss the Bible and that it's true, but they still want to say they're a follower of Jesus Christ. But it's not about following your truth. It's about following the truth because here is the truth. Point two, my life is supposed to submit to his word, not his word submit to my life. My life was created as a follower of Christ to submit to his word, to his commands, to his ways, Instead of trying to find a way to make his word fit my preferences and my lifestyle. This means we have to stop picking and choosing only the parts we like and agree with when it comes to the Bible. In other words, we've got to stop just following and picking God's promises, but not following his instructions and commandments. Because understand, God is not going to rewrite the Bible for you. So stop trying to change scripture when it is written to change you. Hebrews chapter four, verse 12 says this, for the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Can I tell you, when things get exposed in my life and your life, you don't like it. When you're called wrong, you don't like it. And when something exposes us and our motives, we get away from it, we try to hide it right, or we want to cancel it. And the Bible, people have been trying to cancel the Bible for hundreds and hundreds of years. Emperors and kings have tried to wipe the Bible off the planet, and yet it is still alive and growing and thriving. You have governments that are trying to suppress it and pretend that it doesn't exist like the government of China, and yet the underground church is thriving, and the church is memorizing the scriptures, and it is growing like wildfire. You had people that would predict that in 100 years, Christianity won't be around, and yet the Bible is the best-selling book in the history of books, selling over five million, five billion copies over its lifetime. Can I tell you the word of God is alive, active, and strong, and you cannot cancel what you didn't create and you don't control. You can't cancel it because it ain't going anywhere. And the word of God says this about itself. Isaiah 40 verse eight, the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God stands forever. Jesus said this in Matthew 24, 35, heaven and earth will disappear, but my words will never disappear. There are times and there are moments and there are seasons. The Bible doesn't make us feel good, but can I tell you, the Bible always does good when it is allowed room in your life to bring change, to show you what is wrong, and it equips us to do what is right. But if people can't cancel the Bible, they become dismissive of it, right? Well, it's, it's, it's it's, it's an ancient text. It's irrelevant. And when that doesn't work, they decide to start questioning it. Right, well, is that really what's in the word of God? Is that really what God has said? And can I tell you, this tactic has been going on since the beginning of humankind. Genesis chapter three, verse one, the serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. And one day he asked the woman, here it is, did God really say? Did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? And can I tell you, Satan has been whispering those same words in our culture, in our ears. Did God really 
say, and we've been listening to the same lie from the enemy since the beginning of time, and we, we don't like what the Word of God says, we say, did God really say? When we don't agree with what the Word of God says, and it's rebuking and it's correcting, we want to say, did God really say? Instead of surrendering to it and being changed and transformed by it, we question it, and as a result, we drift away from the truth we know, and you know it. And listen to me, in 25 years of doing ministry, I've never met a person that questions the word of God, that diminishes the word of God, that distances themselves from the word of God so they can become more like Jesus. Never seen it. I've never seen somebody question the word of God, diminish the word of God, try to minimize the word of God so that they could become more holy and more righteous. When I see people question the word of God and diminish the word of God, it's so that the further they drift, the less guilty they feel. It's true. The further they drift into compromise and to buying into something that sounds good and sounds like the truth, but it's not, the less guilty they Feel And listen to me, there's a better way for you and I to live than that way. And God has designed a way for you and I to live and to live our life according to the word that I can promise you this, that if you will live your life according to the scriptures and the word of God and not what man's opinion is and not what is popular in society, it will lead you in a better way of living that will lead you to making fewer regrets, right? And making better decisions through it. So let me give you two things about a better way for you to live. The first one is this, don't lean on your own understanding. Don't lean on your own feelings. Don't lean on your own opinions. Don't lean on your own preferences. Don't lean on your own understandings. Proverbs chapter three, verse five and six says this, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, all of them, submit to him and he will make your paths straight. When the Bible says don't lean on your own understanding, on your own understanding, the Bible's being serious. Your heart is deceitful, your emotions fluctuate, your understanding doesn't see the overall big picture, but know this, God never lies, God never changes, and God knows all, so trust him. Submit to him in all your ways, even when the word of God disagrees with your opinions and your preferences and your lifestyle, because it's a better way for you to live. I remember going to tell you right a few years ago, my wife, Casey, and we did this Via Ferrata. It's this climb on the mountains and you're up several hundred feet and you're kind of harnessed in um, and there's some things for you to hold on to and step on and you're crawling across the face of this mountain. And um, if I'm to be honest, I, there were some moments that were really nerve wracking for me, but not so much for Casey. She's like, hurry up, Justin, let's go. And I'm like, who are you? Um, and what have you done with my wife, right? Um, but there was a, a place there and there was a couple of places you weren't able to harness in. There was no place to carabine in and you had a really narrow walking path to get from one climbing spot to the other, and you had to be really careful of where you stepped, of where you walked, and we had a guide that went with us called David the Mountain Guy. Dave, excuse me, Dave the Mountain Guy, right? And Dave was my best friend, and Dave is why I am still alive today. And when we got to this part that was really narrow and you couldn't like harness in, he said this. And when he said it, I about fell off the mountain because I'm like, I'm gonna preach that as many times as possible. He said, hey, this is a really thin, dangerous pass that you can't harness into. So make sure that you lean into the rock so that you don't fall off the cliff. Woo, right? Like lean into the rock so you don't fall off the cliff. I'm like, Bro, you couldn't have said that better. Can I tell you what happens when we lean into our own understanding as we fall off the cliff? And we're not leaning into the rock who is going to get us from point A to point B safely and better. We think we know our own best way. And when that happens, we fall off the cliff because we're buying into something that's not true, that's not biblical, and is not his purpose and his will. And you don't have to, he didn't have to tell me to lean into the rock because the alternative was to fall off completely. And hear me today. Some of us, we 
know the way we should be living. We know what the Bible says, and hear me as your pastor, I want this for you so bad. Don't lean into your own understanding. Don't lean into your opinion. Don't lean into your preference, but submit to him, not in just some of your ways. Submit to him in all your ways. That means this, submit to him in your dating life. Whew. Submit to him when it comes to your married life. Submit to him when it comes to raising your kids. Submit to him when it comes to the friends that you choose to pick and run around with. Submit to him when it comes to the area of your finances. Submit to him when it comes to who's in control of your life. Submit to him in all your ways, and here's the promise. He will make your paths straight. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 6 through 10 says this, don't be fooled by those who try to excuse these sins, for the anger of God will fall on all who disobey him. Don't participate in things these people do. For once, you were full of darkness, but now you have light from the Lord. So live as people of light. For this light within you produces only what is good. I love this, what is right and what is true. Carefully determine what pleases the Lord. And can I encourage you as a pastor, don't get fooled by people who are trying to excuse their habits, actions, and lifestyles. And you know what the Bible says about it is wrong. Instead, carefully determine what pleases the Lord. Because he's created you to be children of light, to be different, and for your life to stand out in a culture that wants to cancel anything that doesn't just go along with the flow. James chapter 1, verse 22 says, but don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you are only fooling yourselves. And for most of us, it's not a matter of us knowing what to do. It's a matter of us doing it. For a lot of us, we know what we are ought to do, but we're not doing it. And when you know what to do, but you don't do it, you know who's getting harmed? You know who's getting fooled? It's you. You're only fooling yourself. So let me leave you with this last thing. And it's simply this. The Bible leads to living life in a bigger and better way. The Bible leads to you and me living our life in a bigger and better way way. John chapter 10 verse 10 says this, the thief comes to only steal and kill and destroy, but I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Jesus is saying this, I've come that you may have a big life and one that is full of purpose, one that is of significance, and one that matters. He didn't just say that you could come and survive life, that you could just kind of slowly make it through life, but he's like, and here's what I know, and here's what Jesus knew. That all of you here, all of you watching online, you have a just felt need that you want to live your life out in a way that matters, that's lived to the full, that's not lived full of regrets, that's not full of of, of just missing the moments that God has, but that you would live your life in such a way that it made a massive impact for God's kingdom and that you are living it, making better decisions and living with fewer regrets. And that happens when you don't do it based on your preference, based on your opinions, based on culture's opinions, based on culture's preference or what's popular, but you do it based on his Word. Psalm chapter 119, verse 105 says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Two weeks ago, we lost power at my house. Um, complete, utter darkness in the middle of the night, um, about six o'clock, and it stayed off for about eight hours. And when it did, I was like, I, I don't have a, a backup generator. I don't have a whole home generator, I don't have, but I do have this bad boy. And this is my lantern. And I was like, Casey, have no fear. I was made for this moment and I keep batteries ready to go. And I have my flashlights out and I have my lantern out. And we are walking around the house literally 
all night long because the power didn't come on till like two in the morning, walking around with this lantern to see where we could go and to place it on certain parts because it didn't just shine like a floodlight where we wanted to go, but it put off enough light to light up a room or to light the situation or to let us know the next step we needed to make, right? I may not be able to see a mile down the road, but I can see the next step that I need to make, whether I can need to stop, whether I need to turn left, whether I need to turn right. And here's what the Bible says. Your word is a lamp unto my feet. There's gonna be moments you don't know where to go. You don't know whether to stop or go, but when you don't know, his word does, right? There's gonna be moments when you're tempted to go this way and his word says this way. Man, follow God's word because it knows where to go. There's gonna be moments you don't have understanding and you don't have wisdom, but his word has wisdom and has understanding. And his word is a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. And it says that his word will not return void if you will follow and if you will listen and if you will abide because he has a better way for you to live. And just like this lantern produced light into my situation and into my room, can I tell you, God's word will produce light. It will bring instruction and it will bring life to your situation in your life because it's a better way for you to live your life. It's a better way for you to live your life. Because understand this, there's gonna be a moment, not if, but when, that your feelings and truth collide. And what wins out? Because understand, spiritual maturity isn't measured by how you jump in praise, but how straight you walk in obedience. Let me say that again. Spiritual maturity isn't measured by how high you raise your arms or how high you jump in praise, but how straight you walk in obedience. And what's gonna win out when your feelings and the truth collide? Because if you haven't determined this yet, if God's word isn't greater than everything else, I'm gonna tell you this, you're gonna follow your feelings. You're gonna follow other people's feelings, other people's insights. And hear me, before, before a situation happens, you have to decide God's word is greater than anything else. God's word is greater than my opinion. God's word is greater than my preference. God's word is greater than what is popular. God's word is greater than what is convenient. God's word is greater than what my parents are doing. God's word is greater than what my teenager is doing. God's word is greater than my friend's opinions and what they say and what culture says. God's word has to be greater than it all. And Jesus said this, Luke 11, verse 28. He said, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. They don't just know it, but you're hearing the word of God. Jesus is saying this, if you hear the word of God today and you keep it, you're blessed and it's a better way for you to live. Several Halloweens ago when my daughter was younger, my youngest daughter, Chloe, she had a bunch of friends over and we went out and each of them had a piece of just crappy Halloween candy. And they went and they played a game called Bigger and Better. And if you've never played Bigger and Better, it's really a fun game to do. Um, I would suggest you have cute teenagers do it and you're not a 70 year old man doing this because it'd be really weird. But you go up to a stranger's house and you knock on the door and they proceeded to say, hey, we're playing bigger and better and I am wondering what you would give me that is bigger and better than this piece of candy. And all of a sudden, people started giving them random junk that they didn't want for that piece of candy, right? And she would get one thing and they would go to another and they would go to another. And after an hour that started with a piece of Halloween candy, Chloe and her friends came back with this putting and chipping apparatus that started from something like this. And I'm going, you got that in an hour. I'm like, what, let's go another hour. Maybe come back with the car, right? Like, I'm like, what, what's going on? And hear me, if strangers would give a strange teenage kid something way bigger and way better than what they brought to their door, can I tell you, when you submit to the Lord all your ways and all your life, and maybe you don't think you've got much to offer, can I tell you, he gives it back way bigger and way better because he came that you may have life and have it to its full. Not just survive, not just be okay, but he always gives back bigger and better, and it is a better way for you to live your life out. It is. So what do you need to trust him with today? 
Because here's the warning, don't drift from this. I mean, this isn't a restriction as much as it is a guiding for you. There's a better way for you to live your life than what culture's telling you. And it's found in his word. Let's pray. Lord, we love you and we thank you for today. And God, I pray today that we would not just be hearers of your word, but as it says in Hebrews chapter two, verse one, that we would listen very carefully to the truth we have heard today or the danger and the warning is this. No matter our age, no matter our stage in life, no matter our upbringing, if we don't listen carefully to the truth of your word today, we're gonna drift from it. We're gonna think it's different because our situation's different. But the truth of your word doesn't change because our situation did. The character of our God does not change because our situation did. It is always the same. And so we can lean into your word And we can lean into the rock instead of our own understanding because your promise is this, when we submit to you in all our ways, you get back bigger and better. You lead us in better ways. And so Lord, I pray today that today's message wouldn't just be a message we listen to, but it would be a message we live out that is a foundational way for us to live our life out. And I thank you and I praise you for it.